The Predator drone started life as a flimsy remote-controlled airplane with a camera. In the course of about a decade, it became a feared killing machine, capable of stalking and firing on its victim while being controlled from the other side of the world. To say that the Predator has changed the nature of warfare is an understatement. Since 9-11, it has been central to the fight against Islamic radical individuals and groups, killing many high-value targets. But the Predator has also enraged local populations when the missiles accidentally kill innocent civilians. Richard Whittle has written a book on the history of the weapon in a book called Predator, The Secret Origins of the Drone Revolution. Richard, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Mimi. So the argument can be made that unmanned drones evolved as the next next logical step in warfare. Why do you call this a revolution? Well, you, you can say that it evolved, and, and certainly the technology that uh, came together in the end to make the Predator was evolving. I mean, I think, I say in the book, I think that uh, if, we, uh, if the Predator hadn't come along, that ultimately unmanned aerial vehicles, as they're technically called, would have become more important over time. But when the t- Predator was invented, they were just a niche technology. And I think that what happened was that uh, uh, wars uh, caused the Predator to be developed very rapidly. And it changed the way people thought about drones. And, and that, was the, that was the revolutionary point for me. Uh, when the Predator was armed and used in Afghanistan to, um, for targeted killings, but also for military operations, uh, you know, and its camera is extremely important. Um, President Bush, uh, after, the, after the war in Afghanistan began, said a few days after the war began, why can we only fly one Predator at a time? We ought to have 50 of these things. And about six weeks later, after the Predator had killed its first high-value target, the third-ranking leader of al-Qaeda, Mohammed Atef, uh, Bush went to the Citadel in South Carolina and said before the war, the Predator had skeptics because it did not fit the old ways. Today it's clear we, the military does not have enough unmanned vehicles. And if I could just add one thing, here's my circumstantial evidence for the fact that that was a revolution. In uh, 2001, as the year began, the military had 82 drones, 82 unmanned aerial vehicles of three different types, the Predator, the Hunter, and the Pioneer. There was a report issued in April of 2001, five months before 9-11, that said that by 2010, the military might have, might have 290 drones, still of three types. Well, when 2010 came around, in fact, the military had 8,000 drones of 14 different types. And I think that the Predator started that ball rolling. You know, the, initially the military just wasn't interested in drones. Was that because they didn't really need it? The, The nature of warfare meant that they didn't need it, or did they just not get it? Well, there was no natural home uh, uh, for unmanned aerial vehicle technology, you know, drones, uh, as they're now called. And, of course, as you know, uh, being an engineer and uh, being familiar with the aerospace industry, uh, people, experts, really don't like that term drone, but it's become the vernacular term. Um, uh, The Air Force... You know, is run by pilots, and pilots weren't that interested in aircraft without one of them in it. Uh, the Army was mainly interested in helicopters. The Army adopted the helicopter with great enthusiasm in Vietnam. Still flies a lot of them today. Uh, Navy ship captains were not fond of the idea of uh, an, a remote-controlled aircraft returning to the deck of their ship full of gasoline with nobody inside to divert the plane if something went wrong. And the Marine Corps never has any money. So, so there, was no, there was no real natural home for drones. Plus, um, you have to remember this. Um, the Predator was the first drone that was a true airplane. I mean, usually they were sort of um, uh, model aircraft on steroids, you know. And, and so um, uh, the Predator changed everything because it was a new type of drone. How do you, how do you see the military being changed by drones? Well, uh, in, in many ways, I mean, the, the Air Force has, adro- has adopted the technology uh, with uh, now, uh, I wouldn't say great gusto, but uh, recognizing its importance. Uh, the, the Air Force today has 139 armed predators and 165 
armed MQ-9 Reapers, which is a larger derivative of the Predator that can carry four Hellfire missiles and two 500-pound bombs, uh, the, uh, air, the uh, Army excuse me, um, is flying its own Predator derivative called the Gray Eagle, uh, which is very similar. Uh, the Navy is testing um, an unmanned uh, combat aerial vehicle, as they call it, the X-47B, uh, that is essentially a fighter plane without a pilot in it. Uh, and that's a technology demonstrator, but they're moving toward uh, having in the range of 2030, having the first uh, drone that will actually be a fighter plane with no fighter uh, pilot in it uh, that will go do combat missions. Uh, so uh, the Air Force now trains more uh, remotely piloted aircraft operators, as they preferred to call them, than regular pilots. And uh, at the Air Force Academy, Cadets get training uh, in flying remotely piloted aircraft, and they can even get uh, RPA wings. So it's changed the military pretty dramatically. The book we're discussing is called Predator, The Secret Origins of the Drone Revolution. Richard Whittle is an author. He's a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center and a former journalist. The, let's talk a little bit about the history of the drone. The, the father of drone technology is... Um, an Israeli by the name of Abe Karam. What was his contribution? Well, Abe Karam, um, many people think, is a genius in aeronautical design. Uh, at the age of, I think, 32, he was the chief of uh, special projects at Israel Aircraft Industries, uh, a, a real innovator. He, in, in 1973, he designed a drone decoy that was meant to fool Arab air defenses and I think that he, he had an epiphany as he did that work, and he decided he wanted to leave uh, IAI, as the company is called, and, uh, and strike out and start developing unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, he didn't have much success at that in Israel, so he immigrated to the United States, and like all great American inventors, went to work in his garage. And uh, uh, a few years later, he had come up with uh, a design for a new kind of drone, uh, he called it the albatross, and I, you know... Not I, realizing that's not well, a good name. Well, as I say in the book, you know, English was probably his fourth or fifth language and probably hadn't read the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. But anyway, uh, but, a, but he's a brilliant man, and um, uh, he designed this, this little drone technology demonstrator that could fly 48 hours without refueling, which was a phenomenal uh, increase in flight time over existing drones. The Army, by the way, in the same period, was developing a little uh, drone that was meant for artillery spotting. It was called the Aquila. And they ended up spending uh, $1.2 billion, I believe it was, uh, over something like 14 years. And, and Congress canceled the Aquila because in their final year of testing, they were only able to make 10 successful flights in 66 attempts. So, uh, so Abe Karam came along, and he had a revolutionary configuration and the Aquila was only meant to fly three hours. And uh, the Albatross could, could, uh, could fly 48. What uh, was his ultimate vision for drones? Well, uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, I don't think that uh, Abe Karam realized it at the time, but things are real, or would think about it much, but the things have come full circle because when he left Israel Aircraft Industries, uh, his first concept for a drone uh, because Israel had just been invaded in 1973 by Egypt and, and um, Syria, his first concept was to have a drone that would circle over the Sinai Peninsula with 40 anti-tank missiles on it and prevent another tank invasion of Israel. Well, we ended up with the Predator, which is, he designed the aircraft, he didn't arm it, he had nothing to do with the arming of it, but uh, we ended up with an, with an aircraft that could that could fly, uh, depending on how it's uh, uh, armed, uh, 24 hours or more, uh, with two anti anti tank missiles on it. So um, uh, I think. So the, during this time, he's working in his garage. He's got this revolutionary thing. This could really change everything, and nobody's interested. Well, there were some people interested, but but they're they're, they're mainly iconoclasts. And one of the one of the things that I. Um, uh, tried to do in the book is point out how all along the way it was iconoclasts, basically, who uh, made the Predator what it was. Uh, so the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, was interested 
But DARPA only funds sort of experimental uh, military research, and they don't they don't uh, produce weapons. They hand these these ideas off to the military, and so uh, DARPA was interested. At first, the Navy and the Army were interested, uh, at, at least in the initial stages. But um, after a few years of uh, Abe Karam developing his albatross into a larger drone called the Amber, um, political factors and competition began to take their toll. And in the end, uh, in, in 1988, I think it is, uh, or 87, Congress uh, got fed up with the Aquila, which I just mentioned, uh, and with the fact that, that the Pentagon was not developing uh, drone technology the way uh, experts in Congress thought they should, and they halved the budget for drone research from 102 million to 52 million, I think. And uh, Abe Karam's Amber was one of the casualties uh, in that. That program got canceled. Fast forwarding to 1995, yep. there's the war in the Balkans. The drones start flying reconnaissance missions over Bosnia. Um, is that when the military is finally impressed with the capabilities? Well, it is, and as as you know, uh, that's when that's when uh, the aha moment began. Uh, I think, with especially with some um, uh, more senior military commanders, uh, because uh, the predator, as you know, was actually um, uh, developed and uh, first flown in 1994 in a six-month project, uh, uh, something revolutionary for the Pentagon under a special procurement program, and in 1995. Uh, it was flying over Bosnia uh, with mixed success, frankly, because the airplane is pretty flimsy. The Serbs shot a couple down. Um, but, the, uh, but in the end, uh, at, one, at a key moment, the Predator crews were able to um, put the lie to Serb claims that they had withdrawn their military forces from strategic locations. Because we could see it on the because screen. Because we could see it mm-hmm. on that video screen. And... Um, and, and that brought Serbia to the negotiating table and, and helped bring about the Dayton Peace Accords. That so when, that when did the idea of arming the predator come about? Because that seems obvious to me. Well, <laughs> I mean, if you're yeah. there, you're mm-hmm. looking at a target, why can't you just shoot it? Well, that's exactly the thought that a very innovative Air Force general named John Jumper had in about 1999. Uh, Jumper said, you know, why don't we put a weapon on this thing so that when the predator sees a target, it can kill that target. And, uh, and so that project began. Uh, General Jumper became the uh, commander of what's called Air Combat Command um, in February of 2000. and May 1st, 2000, he sent out a message, which um, I got a copy of, uh, that, that says uh, the commander of Air Combat Command has rethinking uh, Air Force use of uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets uh, in the form of UAVs, and it's going to take the next logical step. Richard Whittle is in the studio with me. He's an author and a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center. His book is called Predator, The Secret Origins of the Drone Revolution. There was some uh, discussion about now that we've got these Hellfire missiles on a Predator, who gives the command to shoot? Is it right. the military or is it the CIA, since this is, a, you know, typically intelligence gathering operation? <clears throat> mm-hmm. Well, we have to we have to go back and put the, and put this in context a little bit. Uh, I, I mean, it's a very interesting question, but but to, so that people can understand the context in uh, in 2000, about the same time, General Jumper decided to arm the Predator. Uh, a man named Richard Clark, who was at the National Security Council as a counterterrorism advisor and a man named Charlie Allen, who was a senior official at the CIA, were pushing very hard for the United States to kill Osama bin Laden before he killed more Americans. Uh, Al-Qaeda had bombed our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998. Uh, October 12, 2000, Al-Qaeda would end up bombing the USS Cold destroyer, killing 17 American sailors. Anyway, um, So they Rick, saw, <clears throat> obviously, a clear use for the predator well, to go after. Well, f- well the first problem was, how do you find Osama bin Laden? They knew he was in Afghanistan, but finding him so that you could target him with something uh, was a problem. And so an Air Force general, not General Jumper, but another one, uh, suggested to them, send a predator to look for him. And so I tell the story in my book of how what uh, people in the Air Force called the Summer Project came about, 
where they put a ground control station at Ramstein Air Base in Germany. Uh, they based some predators in Uzbekistan uh, at a secret airfield. And they flew an unarmed predator over Afghanistan in September of 2000 and saw Osama bin Laden at a place called Tarnak Farms. But seeing him, uh, President Clinton uh, had used cruise missiles to try to kill bin Laden in 1998. So an after armed the predator bombing. had him. No. Uh, at that point, the predator was not yet armed. It was not armed. General Jumper had decided to arm it, but that project was tied up because the State Department said if you put missiles on a predator, you'll be creating uh, a, a ground launch cruise missile, which is banned by the uh, 1987 U.S.-Soviet Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Uh, the Air Force didn't agree with that logic. So the unarmed predator is flown over Afghanistan, spots bin Laden, Richard Clark, and his allies within the government start uh, uh, immediately start pressing for the State Department to back away from this idea. They do. Uh, the real project to arm the predator begins January 23, 2001, uh, on, a, on a concrete pad at uh, China Lake Naval Weapons Station in the desert of California, where the predator is strapped down and the first Hellfire missile is fired off of it. And, uh, and I tell the story of how it was then armed in succeeding months. But when, <clears throat> that, when we had that shot of, of bin Laden on camera, right. couldn't we have called a fighter jet or somebody to take him out? Well, the uh, argument was that um, uh, the, the swiftest way to get a weapon uh, to where he was would have been to fire a cruise missile. Uh, Richard Clark showed me a chart that, uh, that was made for him by someone at the CIA that showed the spool-up times, how, how long it would take to get a cruise missile fired from a ship uh, out in the ocean to fly so to he Afghanistan. He would have been gone by then. He could have been gone by then. And so for that reason, the White House said, no, we're not going to do it that way. And that's when the idea of using an armed predator to go after bin Laden began. And that's when, and the project to arm the predator, that's when Clark and company intervened, uh, got that project on the fast track. And by the summer of 2001, they were debating within the CIA, the National Security Council, uh, and the Defense Department should we try to kill bin Laden with an armed predator? And if we do, who's going to pull the trigger? Going back to your question, who's going to pull the trigger, the military or the CIA? And that was a huge debate. And what, did, what was the solution? Well, you know, uh, what did they the, the, to, there was a lot of angst. You know, the, the CIA operates under what's called Title 50 of the U.S. Code, which governs the intelligence community. And under presidential findings, or essentially executive orders, which are secret uh, in, in many cases and in this case. And so uh, the, the CIA would need to have a, a very clear presidential finding that they were authorized to kill this man with that, and that it would be legal. Uh, you know, there was an executive order. Ex existing. Even though he had declared war on us years right. earlier. Right. Well, at that time, remember, this is before 9-11, so we did not have in law the uh, authorization for the use of military force against al-Qaeda that Congress passed immediately after 9-11. So, uh, and the military's feeling uh, was, well, if we're going to go try to kill this guy, we're not going to send a flimsy little plane with a missile on it that might miss him. We're going to send B-52s, you know. <laughs> so, um, the, so the military was reluctant to use the predator. The CIA was reluctant to pull the trigger. Uh, George Tenet, the CIA director at the time, thought that it was wrong, uh, possibly illegal, for the CIA director to have the final say on using a military weapon to conduct a mission that might lead to a headline like uh, CIA assassinates Islamic militant. The book we're discussing is called Predator, The Secret Origins of the Drone Revolution. Richard Whittle is the author of that book and also a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center. So tell me about that very first predator shot in Afghanistan. Well, it was the um, it was the result of um, uh, what, in effect, was a was a, a failure of command and control. Uh, on the first night of the war, uh, there was a small Air Force crew uh, at the CIA campus, uh, not in the CIA headquarters building, but in a in a double wide mobile home and in a ground control station, something like a freight container. Uh, sitting uh, not too far from the daycare center uh, out on the parking lot. 
And they were controlling a predator, an armed predator that had launched from Uzbekistan and was flying over Afghanistan. And as the war began, they were circling over a compound where, because of other intelligence, they knew that the Taliban leader, Mullah Muhammad Omar, was. And they followed him for several hours, and they had several opportunities to kill him, which could have made a huge difference uh, in how that war unfolded. Uh, and General Tommy Franks would not give the order for Why not? various reasons. Well, wh- the, best, the best opportunity they had came uh, when they followed Mullah Omar in a little convoy of vehicles to a compound about 13 kilometers southwest of Kandahar. Uh, they, the the uh, lieutenant colonel who was conducting the operation was in the ground control station, said over the uh, communication system they had to the people on the sixth floor at the CIA, I've got the shot. I, I tell all this in the book, by the way, from the point of view of the people who did it. because And it's incredibly frustrating them. because and, you're kind of uh, like, take the shot, take the shot. <laughs> right. And everybody's like, oh, I got to call somebody else. Right. And, uh, and General Franks was in Tampa, Florida at Central Command Headquarters. The air commander, General Chuck Wald, and, uh, and the commander of what's called the Combined Air Operations Center, uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia at Prince Sultan Air Base were also on the lines here watching the mission. Uh, the guys in the ground control station uh, were ready to uh, fire a missile at uh, Mullah Muhammad Omar. Uh, general Franks apparently was told by his judge advocate general, his lawyer, staff lawyer, or others, that uh, w- th- there was a building near where Mullah Omar was standing that might be a mosque, and he was under strict orders from President Bush not to inflict any damage on mosques. Uh, Both the people at the CIA, CIA people and Air Force people who were there, thought, A, that building is not a mosque, and B, we're not going to hit it. Uh, The people at the CAOC, as it's called uh, at Prince Sultan Air Base, they they wanted to bomb the building that, that he was standing next to and then went inside. And they knew that even with 500-pound bombs, they wouldn't damage this building that Frank's staff thought was a mosque. But Frank's was the commander, and, and he made the call. So in the end, he said um, he, he ordered the Air Force team at the CIA to put a missile into a vehicle that was outside the building Mullah Omar had gone into on the theory that you would be able to follow him from there to a place where you could bomb him without hitting a mosque. And in the resulting confusion, he got away and, as far as I know, has never been seen by Western eyes again. So what about that was the first shot? Then? That was, was the first the... shot. And, and, and uh, I interviewed the man who pulled the trigger, Captain Scott Swanson. Uh, and he and his sensor operator, who has since passed away, uh, watched uh, as the missile uh, blew up that vehicle and killed a couple of uh, Mullah Mo- uh, Omar's security guards who were standing nearby uh, he related to me very vividly how uh, the man's body flew into the air. Uh, something that I think, uh, frankly, Scott Swanson is still thinking it's, about. It's interesting today. that you bring that up, the people that are pulling the trigger, because you say this in the book, quote, operating the Predator was less like flying an attack aircraft than like being a sniper lying in ambush, which for some made the act of killing somehow seem more personal. Yes. This really impacted the people. Well, it did. It did. I think that because unlike uh, an attack uh, aircraft, you shoot and then you get out. You don't see the aftermath. Well, one of the people I interviewed for the book, and and another person whose full, whose actual name I don't use, but I use her her uh, uh, call sign as a fighter pilot, Genghis, uh, a, a very interesting woman who had been one of the first U.S. Uh, female uh, fighter pilots, flew F-15s. Uh, dropped bombs on targets in Kosovo, uh, and she told me that um, you know the um, uh, the experience was entirely different. That uh, uh, if you uh, kill someone by dropping a bomb on a tank, you don't see the person, you don't see the aftermath. Generally, uh, with the predator, you linger and you sit and watch. Uh, you can you see everything You sit and watch beforehand. Happening. You see the person that you're targeting. Generally. Not always. They might be in a vehicle or a building. Uh, and, and often you see the aftermath because the predator lingers in the air to do what, um, partly to do what's called uh, bomb damage assessment uh, to, to see what's happened. And sometimes uh, in, in operations they will follow 
uh, people who escape. Uh, you know, the Hellfire is actually a very small weapon. It has a, a 20-pound warhead. I've been told, uh, I didn't interview Donald Rumsfeld, but I've been told that in the early days of these operations, uh, he was furious at times because sometimes the Hellfire missile would hit a vehicle and the people inside would get out and walk away. Just because uh, it wasn't powerful because enough? Because it wasn't powerful enough. Richard, I wonder what your thoughts on are um, on drones being used here in this country? Well, uh, it's a complicated question. I think that uh, it's certainly a risk. Um, you know, uh, it, the, the whole drone revolution raises a number of serious issues that we as a society have to sort out. It also raises that issue. And I know uh, that the Secret Service, for instance, is, is quite concerned about the possibility. I, I would say I don't, I don't think that uh, we have to fear too much the idea of other countries uh, constructing uh, drones the size of the Predator or larger that will carry uh, major weapons. Because we have uh, air defense well, systems. Well, well, they can probably penetrate uh, into the United States because they're hard enough to see uh, and our borders are, are long and porous So why shouldn't enough. we worry about it? Well, uh, I think that once, once they're, uh, you know, you know it's, it could be a one-time thing, right? Uh, the communications uh, setup that allows us to fly predators and reapers on the other side of the earth is the secret sauce here. You know, uh, yeah, theoretically, somebody could launch a drone from, say, Cuba, or some, some place in Mexico, and maybe it could penetrate our borders and maybe it could do some damage, but it wouldn't be a serious military threat. But I think the, you know, but why go to all that trouble when instead you can uh, buy a radio-controlled model uh, and you can get a large one and you can put explosives in it and I, I think it's, uh, we, we've already had one uh, man, uh, I don't remember the details of the case, but who was arrested for plotting to fly such a radio-controlled model, uh, I think, into the Pentagon. And um, uh, I, would, I, would, I think that is the greater threat because those are small enough uh, that nobody's going to notice it probably until it's almost too late. Richard Whittle, the book is called Predator, The Secret Origins of the Drone Revolution. He's the author of that book and also a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Richard, thanks so much for being on the program. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed it.